Howdy, my name is Sarah Schulman and I'm one of the partners of In With Forward. In With Forward is a small social enterprise which works around the world to try and transition our social safety nets into trampolines. Many of our social services and welfare programs and overall systems were designed to try and keep people from falling or to, to ensure that when they fall it was a softer landing. But they weren't really there to enable people to flourish, to bounce up or to bounce forwards. And so that's what we're really about. We work across a whole range of issue areas, everything from disability to domestic violence to youth at risk to families in crisis, uh, to try and make and test and tweak new kinds of services and neighborhood networks from the ground up. And we don't really think that innovative solutions are necessarily good solutions. So our problem solving approach is inherently self-critical and we ask a lot of tough questions about what is good and for whom. And core to our problem solving approach is really flipping the order of how solutions, whether they're programs or services or policies, are typically made. So most programs or policies or services are made by starting with the experts or the professionals or the funders who name a problem. And then they look at what their available resources are or their inputs. They set targets or outputs and then they implement activities. And finally, at the very last minute, they measure to see what outcomes are actually achieved. Now, we like to start work in the totally opposite direction. And so we wanted to share with you the direction in which we work, uh, ask some of the questions that we typically ask in a project, and see if we could challenge you to ask similar questions in the context of your work. All right, well, first to some background um, and the current context uh, of our own project work. So I'm talking to you from British Columbia, which is a province in Canada, and we are currently working across four local cities, Vancouver, Burnaby, New Westminster, and Coquitlam, with three of the province's largest disability service providers. Burnaby Association for Community Inclusion, Simon Fraser Society for Community Living, and Possibilities. Now, we are making and testing and tweaking a new service that we're calling Kudos. And Kudos matches individuals who have a cognitive disability to novel and surprising one-to-one -one learning experiences. All to expand their sense of self, their interests, their purpose, and their sense of possibility. So our work began back in April uh, with a very sticky social challenge. The first question we always ask is who names the problem and who experiences the problem? Now, in the context of our work, the three service providers and the government funder named the problem. And they said that there were too many individuals with a cognitive disability who were isolated from the community and experiencing the effects of disconnection. Our first step in our work is always to reframe the problem from the perspective of the people supposedly experiencing it. And so to do that, we moved into a social housing complex and we spent three months having breakfasts and lunches and dinners and coffees and going shopping into the drugstore and doing all of the day to day activities with the residents of that building to try and understand people's lived realities. So the question that I would pose to you is where could you go to get to know the people experiencing the problem that you've named and what could you actually observe to gain a totally different perspective? So one of the stories that sticks in my mind of somebody that gave us a very different perspective is Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin is in her 50s. Uh, she grew up in an institution and then moved into a group home and she now lives on her own with her cat. And she actually is connected to the community. She has a job at a recycling plant three days a week. She goes to a local coffee group one day a week. And she knows most of her neighbors in the residence. And yet, we'd say that Caitlin is quite bored and stuck. She talked about feeling tired and exhausted of going to the same job for 15 years, where she separates the color paper from the white paper. Uh, she's met the same individuals and had the same conversations over coffee for a good decade. And Caitlin feels like she's got nothing really to look forward to because every day just sort of repeats itself. From Caitlin and many other residents like her, we started to question then whether disconnection was really the problem, or perhaps it was the poverty of novel learning experiences, the kind of experiences that expand your sense of self and your sense of what's possible. 
And so that's really uh, that first question for us, reframing the problem from disconnection in this case to poverty of experience. Now, when we question what the real problem is, that leads us to our second question, which is, well, what is a good outcome and for whom? We don't think that the absence of a problem is necessarily a good outcome. You know, the absence of social isolation and disconnection, for example, isn't inherently good. I mean, just think about gangs. They've got high levels of social cohesion and high levels of connectedness, and yet it's a kind of connectedness that keeps individuals stuck and often engaging in really destructive behaviors. So a great outcome for Caitlin isn't simply connections. It's not simply a job like she already has, or friendly neighbors, or participation in existing community activities. A great outcome for Caitlin are connections that help her to grow and to develop and to find what she's actually passionate about, which is probably not sorting colored paper. So we like to identify great outcomes through a combination of ethnographic fieldwork and social science reading. We find it really important to draw on issue-specific literature, so in this case stuff from the disability field or stuff from other marginalized populations, in order to play back some concepts or frameworks to people that they might not ordinarily be able to talk about or articulate themselves. You know, we're all limited by what we've seen, so Caitlin has been particularly limited over her lifetime in terms of what she's experienced. And so if we ask her a direct question about what do you want to see in your life, we're probably going to get a pretty typical response back. Uh, so in this project, we found a framework from Carol Riff, and she's a psychologist who worked with some philosophers to try and name six component parts of a flourishing life. Some of those component parts are about purpose or they are about uh, you know, novel positive relationships. And so we were able to take those quite abstract frameworks and make them really concrete by using a deck of cards that we then presented to Caitlin. And they helped her to trigger some new thoughts or ideas. Those are things that she probably wouldn't have ordinarily told us. So the third question we ask is what enables or disenables great outcomes? And to answer that question, we tend to seek out extreme users. So those are people who are either experiencing really great outcomes all by themselves without necessarily utilizing existing services or programs, as well as people that are experiencing really lousy outcomes. And we try and use those two extremes in order to extrapolate what are some of the factors that enable people to do really well and what are some of the things that are standing in the way of people doing really well. And so as an example, back in May, we met a family called the Underhills and they've got two sons who are in their early 20s who are diagnosed with autism. But both sons aren't spending their days doing the same thing day after day. Both sons have actually found their passions and they're engaged in all sorts of different kind of learning. They actually don't go to the standard day programs that most folks with a disability do. And they live in a house where their family treats most moments as a teachable moment. Uh, and their parents look at everyone in their environment, whether it's the nurse that comes in or uh, some other staff, as a resource to help them expose their sons to new things. And the flip side, we also met individuals like Mark. Uh, Mark's in his 30s now and is really regressing. His health is rapidly deteriorating, as is his speech. But 20 years ago, Mark was in quite a different situation, and he graduated from high school and had all sorts of potential. He was enrolled at community college. He had a real passion for travel and hospitality. But going to the same day program, which is kind of like babysitting for the past 13 years, and learning to cook the same spaghetti dish every year has really closed him down, has really disenabled him um, from having access to surprising or novel things. So the question I would pose to you is, do you know what the factors are that enable or disenable the outcomes you're after? And how well do you know these things? How could you go and meet the extreme users in order to find some of the, the factors that may not be on your radar screen now that are essential for getting to better outcomes? Now, all these questions may sound very researchy, um, but at the end of the day, we don't see ourselves as researchers. We see ourselves as real doers, as implementers. Um, the reason why we're trying to identify the outcomes and the factors that enable those outcomes is in order to figure out what kinds of interactions we could build or make that might actually bring about change or remove some of the barriers to change. 
And so that leads us to the fourth question that we always ask in our work, which is what interactions actually prompt change and for whom? Now an interaction might be between people or it might be between people and objects. So if somebody like Caitlin is having the same conversations with the people at her coffee group every week, we might think about how we could shift those interactions. Could we introduce a new prop, you know, maybe a deck of cards with questions or visuals? Could we change the location or the setting of her coffee date? Could we add new people or take away new people or change the roles or change what it is that they talk about? Now, to answer that, those questions and figure out, well, which interactions would we tweak or change in order to see something different for somebody like Caitlin, we actually have to make it, and that's what we call prototyping. We run small versions of new interactions where we make new props and we change the setting and we change what it is that people do and we change what they talk about in order to see what people respond to and to see how their behavior is affected. And that's what we're doing right now on the ground with Kudos the new service we're building. We're actually recruiting 40 individuals like Caitlin to choose from hundreds of one-to-one -one learning experiences so that we can learn what actually prompts change. Uh, and so you can prototype not just uh, by doing things on paper, not just by coming up with ideas in your head, but by actually making them live at a small scale um, to, to learn what works and what doesn't. So I guess the question for you is, what could you make or build or tweak to try out a piece of your solution? And have you designed your solution at the level of interactions or have you only designed your solution at the level of activities? You know, when we look at most programs and services out there, we see that they're not designed at the right level of granularity. So they're designed at the level of the coffee group. They might specify for people like Caitlin, oh, run a coffee group five days a week. But actually, that doesn't tell us very much about what happens within that coffee group. And it's all of those small component parts, it's all of those small interactions that will really make the difference between somebody experiencing a great outcome and somebody not. So finally, the last question that we like to ask in our work is, what latent resources could we draw on to make our interactions? You know, we think that there is a ton of human resources that are underutilized or untapped and that part of a good solution is drawing on that stuff. So for Kudos, we are tapping into existing staff resource. There are well over 10,000 workers in the disability care system in British Columbia. They drive people like Caitlin to appointments. They organize social outings like bowling. They teach life skills. But actually, they're not often drawing on their own personal passions. So we thought that the first step in making kudos would be to audit all of the untapped passions and skills of staff. And so far we've met about 140 staff and learned um, that there are at least 350 unique passions and skills, everything from gravy making to forest bathing. And yes, forest bathing is a thing. Um, and so this is the raw material upon which to create all of our catalog of novel and surprising experiences for people like Caitlin to go on. So what untapped human resources could you draw on in your solution? How could you find out about the hidden talents or skills or capabilities and networks of people that you might use uh, to actually build or make your solutions? Okay. So let me recap what our five questions are that we ask in every project. We ask who sets the problem and who experiences the problem? What's a good outcome and for whom? What enables or disenables good outcomes? What interactions actually prompt change and for whom? And what resources are there to draw on? Now, you know, we're constantly questioning and having to go back to questions at each stage of the project. So, you know, we're now figuring out what interactions actually prompt change, but it's leading us to new insights about things like enablers or disenablers and how to better specify what a great outcome is. So it isn't a linear process question asking, it's a continual activity. Uh, and we encourage you to do it and to tell us how it goes and which questions actually help further your solution along. So happy questioning. So if you'd like to learn more about what we do, log on to our website, www.inwithforward.com, and you can read some of our ethnographic stories if you want a sense of what that methodology is all about. You can also read more about Kudos and the starter project from which it came, and you can visit kudos, K-U-D-O-Z dot C-A, to see more about that particular solution.